Welcome back to Coursera. This is lecture nine. Now we're going to continue our discussion about movements of proximal muscles by concentrating on a second set of muscles that are acting on the pectoral girdle, mainly by acting on the shoulder blade or the scapula and driving or dragging the clavicle along with it. Our muscles, as we indicated earlier, that have the ability to pull the pectoral girdle, in this case mainly the scapula, around the circumference of the chest wall. And we, when we move the pectoral girdle horizontally about the chest wall, and we move it in an anterior direction, basically this would be anterior, that's known either as protraction, or as you'll see in our digital atlas, that's also known as scapular or pectoral girdle abduction. Then, to return the pectoral girdle to its anatomic position, we need to retract it. So we're going to need some muscles that attach more to the medial aspect of it to pull it back in the anatomic position, which is also known as adduction. So let's identify the players by looking at our chart. So certainly the major muscle that's playing the most active role in protraction or scapular abduction is the serratus anterior, most of its fibers, a broad muscle that attaches to the lateral chest wall. This is also going to be assisted by the pectoralis minor, as we will see. Note that the serratus anterior is innervated by something called the long thoracic nerve. It is the only muscle innervated by the long thoracic nerve, and that long thoracic nerve, as you'll hear in a subsequent conversation, is particularly vulnerable to laceration or surgical disruption because unlike most nerves that innervate muscles anywhere, the long thoracic nerve is coursing on the superficial surface of the serratus anterior as it lies on the anterolateral chest wall. And we'll go document basically this by our, our pen when we show the muscle in a moment. So this is unusual because most muscles are receiving their muscular innervation from their deep surface, which protects the innervation of that corresponding muscle. All right, so let's look at a little better view of what scapular pro and retraction correspond to. So we showed movements of the pectoral girdle in isolation. But in essence, what's happening is, as we've indicated, is we are rotating the pectoral girdle kind of in the anterior direction toward the nose by moving it along with the clavicle horizontally about the circumference of the chest wall. Here we are protracting it. And here we are moving it in the opposite direction by moving it back toward the dorsal midline by replacing it back in the anatomic position by retracting it or adducting it. And certainly, the upper limb is always going along for the ride. So we can see the humerus, basically in the arm, forearm, and the hand, basically moving as we protract or retract the scapula. So think about what you're doing when you do a push-up. When you're doing a push-up, basically, you are protracting and retracting your pectoral girdle, along with pushing yourself off and lowering yourself down by flexing and extending other joints that involve basically the upper limb. So let's look at the players. Here is the broad position of the serratus anterior. What we really can't see in this view is the serratus anterior has a very broad attachment to the vertebral border of the scapula on its anterior surface. We can't see that attachment. All we see are the kind of diverging slips of the serratus anterior as they fan out and have broad attachments to the anterolateral chest wall, basically through mainly ribs two through nine. And this position certainly puts this muscle in a major way in a position to pull the scapula and therefore the pectoral girdle anteriorly, basically along the anterolateral chest wall. But as we've already indicated, if I kind of erase this a little bit, and basically note that the long thoracic nerve, which is innervating this muscle, as we indicated, occupies a superficial position as it descends along the lateral aspect of this muscle, putting that nerve at some risk during surgical procedures or even lateral chest wall trauma. Then, again, 
the other protractor is going to be our friend that we've already seen, and this is the pectoralis minor that certainly a, in a lecture ago was playing a role in depression, obviously, of the pectoral girdle. So we can't really see this pectoralis minor muscle because it's largely hidden basically by the much more impressive fibers of the pectoralis major that dominate the anterior chest wall and our friend over there on the left side of the slide. All right, so those are going to be the muscles which are going to protract the scapula. How about the muscles that are going to retract the scapula or re basically replace it back into the anatomic position? And this is going to be an additional action of the rhomboid muscles, and arguably this is their major action. We've already seen them playing a role above in scapular elevation. But the middle fibers of the trapezius are probably going to be certainly the best and most powerful muscle fibers that are capable of pulling the pectoral girdle back to the anatomic position by retracting or adducting it in the horizontal plane. So really, the best muscle that's the best protractor is the serratus anterior, innervated by the long thoracic nerve. And the middle fibers of the trapezius, which are innervated by that kind of misplaced cranial nerve that arise from cervical spinal cord, and that's the accessory. So here are those individual fibers. Here are the middle fibers of the trapezius. There they are. They're certainly in a position to pull the pectoral girdle by pulling the spine of the scapula and the girdle along with it back into the anatomic position in the horizontal plane, as are the fibers of the rhomboids that are certainly also in a very good position to retract the scapula by pulling on its vertebral border and pulling it basically back into the anatomic position. Here is a lateral view of the serratus anterior. There's the serratus anterior right there and the pectoralis minor. And if we tilt this, you can see quite nicely from above how these two muscles are capable of moving the scapula and therefore the pectoral girdle horizontally along the chest wall by pulling it along with the upper limb in the anterior direction. So you can certainly see a very good view of that. And there we see, obviously, the action performed, in this case, by the fibers of the pectoralis minor as well. Again, from above is where you get the more accurate view of how these two muscles are pulling, particularly the vertebral border of the scapula, forward on the anterior chest wall. And you can't really see it too well, just barely. You can see how the fibers, the more posterior fibers of the fascicles of the serratus anterior are attached firmly to the vertebral border of the scapula, and when they contract, certainly they're pulling the entire scapula horizontally on the chest wall, along with the pectoralis minor, which again we've said is attached to the coracoid process. Then let's compare this action with a corresponding series of muscles which perform the opposite action, and this is going to be scapular adduction. So now we're looking at the posterior chest wall, and you're seeing the middle fibers of the trapezius. However, when I highlight the trapezius, I get the whole thing. But note that the arrow is positioned right over the middle fibers, which again are playing a major role in pulling the scapula and therefore the pectoral girdle back into the anatomic position. Then if we rotate this around to the front, it's very difficult to see the rhomboids because they're kind of masked by the fibers of the trapezius, which largely covers them. And Basically, there you can see, hidden back through the rib cage, the fibers of the rhomboid minor, rhomboid major, sorry, and just above them, there are the fibers of the rhomboid minor. So we really can't see them well because they're almost entirely hidden by the, obviously, the fibers of the trapezius. We can just barely get a hint of them. Let's see if we can pick them up here. There are the fibers right there of the rhomboid major because they lie immediately deep to virtually all of the fibers of the inferior aspect of the trapezius and obviously hide them very successfully. 
but certainly these two muscles are those that are playing the most active role in returning the pectoral girdle by retracting or adducting it back to the anatomic position. Now lastly, let's look at the third series of muscles that are acting about a very different axis. These muscles are kind of acting an axis that goes through the back of the scapula, moving from posterior to anterior, and these muscles, as we indicated earlier, are going to upwardly or downwardly rotate the scapula, and we kind of defined that movements by showing movements of the acromion process, but you can certainly include the inferior angle in that process as well. This is a necessary series of actions to enable the arm to be better or more effectively abducted at the shoulder joint. So lateral or upward rotation occurs when the arm is abducted in the coronal plane, and medial or downward rotation will occur when the arm is returned to the anatomic position. So again, what are we looking at? We're looking at parts of mother, other muscles that have already played a role in additional or other scapular actions. Note that probably the lower half of the trapezius, the inferior portion of the trapezius, is going to play a major role in this process by pulling the inferior angle of the scapula upwardly or laterally. And also, the upper and lower parts of the trapezius are capable of rotating the scapula around that axis that we drew basically through its posterior wall by pulling up basically on the acromion process by the upper fibers and down on the spine of the scapula by the lower fibers, but in essence, both of them playing a role in the upward rotation. So upward rotation is certainly being controlled by nerves that were similar to those that were performing or controlling either protraction or retraction. Then our medial rotation or our downward rotation that occurs as we return the arm to its anatomic position, this is going to be assisted by gravity. So this doesn't require as powerful muscles to perform the actions, kind of analogous to scapular depression above when we talked about that. So what's going to participate in this process? Gravity. And also the rhomboid muscles and the levator scapulae, they're going to pull up on the medial aspect of the scapula and therefore cause the lateral aspect of the scapula go, to go down. And the pectoralis minor is also going to play a role in this process. So let's look at the players. Here again are the inferior fibers of the serratus anterior. So these fibers, when they contract, are going to pull just the inferior angle of the scapula basically in an upward direction. And that's going to cause the glenoid fossa when the humerus abducts to also start to face in an upward direction. So the inferior fibers of the serratus will obviously participate in lateral rotation. Then our lateral rotators will also be assisted by both the upper and the lower fibers of the trapezius. They are going to basically rotate the trapezius about an axis that goes through the posterior wall of the scapula and by pulling either down on the scapular spine or up on the scapular spine these muscles, I'll change color here, up there or down there, they're going to cause the lateral angle where the humerus is articulating with the scapula to move in that direction. Then our medial rotators will, as we've already indicated, be really smaller muscles because they're being assisted by gravity. They will be the levator scapulae and the two rhomboid muscles. They're going to pull particularly the rhomboid major, they're going to pull the inferior angle of the scapula back in the anatomic position and cause the area where the shoulder's articulating to return downwardly, downward or medial rotation, to the anatomic position. So now, using our digital atlas, we can see in this particular view, again, the role played by the inferior and the superior fibers of the trapezius. Both of them are participating in the upward rotation of the scapula. 
the superior fibers by pulling up on the acromion and the lateral aspect of the scapular spine, the inferior fibers by pulling down on the scapular spine, but the net effect is the same. They are rotating the scapula through an axis, probably this passing through the scapular spine from posterior to anterior, and the net effect is you can see the lateral portion of the scapula, particularly the glenoid fossa, moving upwardly as the humerus is being abducted in the coronal plane array from the midline axis of the body. But not to be outdone, if we rotate this over here, you can see again that the fibers of the serratus anterior, although not as obviously, can play a role in this process. Now our highlighter has certainly indicated all of the fibers of the trapezius, but it's really the inferior fibers that are playing a major role in this action by pulling the inferior angle of the scapula anteriorly and in doing so, causing upward rotation of the area where the humerus is articulating. We kind of see this even better in an anterior view as shown here by the action of the inferior fibers of the serratus and both the upper and the lower fibers of the trapezius. Then if we compare this with the downward rotation of the scapula, that's our next picture, we again will see the role, as we indicated, played by both the levator scapulae, which is really a minor player, but you can see that the two rhomboid muscles are really playing a major role, not only as we saw earlier in retraction of the scapula, but particularly the lower part of the rhomboid major is pulling the vertebral border of the scapula and the inferior angle back in the anatomic position, and it's causing a downward or medial rotation of the portion of the scapula that's articulating with the humerus during adduction.